this is Selma Schimmel for the Group Room at AACR's annual meeting. That's the American Association for Cancer Research. We are in Chicago. Happy to be joined now by Dr. Ronald DePino, who's the president of UTMD Anderson Cancer Center. Hello. Great to be here. Thanks for spending some time because we're going to talk about a subject that's really hard to avoid. We should all live long enough to age. The question is, can we age without cancer? And I think uh, the name of your topic actually is aging and cancer. Can we do one without the other? So there is a long-standing link, an intimate link, between advancing age and cancer. In fact, beyond the age of 60, the incidence of cancer doubles every five years. And essentially, by the time you're about 80, you have roughly a one in two chance of developing cancer. The question is, if we understood the basis for that, could we in fact control the development of cancer? So today, there is a very good understanding of the molecular determinants that drive the increased development of cancer when you age. These elements are, these factors include damages of your DNA, particularly the ends of your chromosomes. These are so-called telomeres. And with time, you accumulate significant damage at your telomeres. And that then leads to a period of instability. You reshuffle your genetic deck. And rare cells will accumulate the right constellation of genetic alterations to propel them towards becoming a cancer. And the telomeres, if I understand, as they shorten, they enhance aging? That's right. I mean, that's that intimate link. That is, when you begin to get damage of your telomeres, it activates a pathway, a molecular circuit, that when it becomes active, leads to problems in the cell that lead to cell senescence and diminished energy production, increased free radicals. And so at the heart of that process, you generate this feed-forward circuit in which you get damage, you then create more free radicals, which then create more damage. If there are some compounds, which I know in the world of biologics, there may be ones that can damage the telomeres. What happens with some of these new cancer drugs that are causing that damage that have a positive result in maybe tumor reduction? Perhaps I've heard some of the PARP inhibitors can do this. What's that correlation with cancer? Well, there is, in fact, a significant impact that uh, on tissues in general which really promote aging and age-related processes as a result of widespread chemotherapeutic application that damages DNA. Fortunately, however, there are significant repair mechanisms so that most of that damage is undone in normal cells. So you more or less reset the clock when you have these transient periods where you receive these agents. But nevertheless, they do have a long-term impact and in fact, one of the challenges that we have in cancer it, therapy is not only to deliver drugs that are effective and lead to durable responses and cure for those patients, but to also preserve the quality of life. And this is the promise of targeted therapy, that we can direct therapies that are squarely directed to differences in cancer cells versus normal cells and therefore spare normal cells of exactly the same kinds of side effects that you mentioned. What about the biology of cancer of, I mean, you, we've talked about the telomeres, but what about when you look at the young adult cancer versus the cancer in an older person? Is the biology of the disease yes. significantly different? Yes, it is. I mean, for the most part, most young cancers and the types of cancers that you get are driven by a different constellation of genetic alterations and different processes. A lot of those cancers arise as a result of abnormalities in the circuits that control cell differentiation, cell development. 
the sorts of control switches that enable an embryo to ultimately become an established, you know, multicellular, multi-organ human being, an adult. And what happens in those cancers is that they target pathways that commandeer the uh, pathways that are involved in cell fate, cell differentiation, and make those cells achieve more of an embryonic state. So the genetic basis for a lot of the pediatric and young adult cancers tend to be driven by those sorts of developmental abnormalities as opposed to the cancers which affect an aged population, which tend to be cancers that arise from epithelium, the lining of your uh, intestines or the layering of your skin, the ducts in your breast. Those are so-called epithelium, and those epithelium are, are the origins of 84% of cancers that affect the adult population. Are they less virulent than perhaps the younger adult cancers? No, when they achieve their full malignant state, they can be very, very, very aggressive and malignant. And in fact, are often characterized by rampant chromosomal changes, genetic changes, mm -hmm. many, many different alterations in these cancers, providing a, a tremendous challenge for us to be able to take, for example, single drugs and really cure those cancers because there are so many different alterations that are driving the development of those cancers. So the focus now is to really try to conquer those cancers by combining therapeutic agents that attack this sea of complexity in the cancer genome. Is the incidence of the older population being diagnosed with cancer rising? Yes, that, this is a huge problem. And it's a problem worldwide and one that uh, I think our nation is not paying full enough attention to. By the year 2025, we're going to have 1.2 billion people over the age of 60. Essentially, since 1955, when the worldwide life expectancy was 42, we've essentially doubled since then. It's now 74 and rising. So the world is careening towards a very significant crisis because beyond the age of 60, you have this exponential increase in the incidence of cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and Alzheimer's. And so with that, the aging of America and the world, we have this very significant issue that we'll be facing in this coming century, which is the impact of this changing demographics and all of these age-associated diseases in the plus 60 period. So part of what's happening is that we're living longer. And I would imagine also that there are contributing factors, environmental exposures. Correct. So it turns out that the most significant risk factor for the development of cancer is part of the natural aging process as we described. Cells turn over, your telomeres get damaged, you end up creating all this instability, and so on. And that, in turn, leads to responses in the cell that further propel that cell to become a cancer. Having said that, those very processes are also significantly attenuated by activities such as exercise, uh, maintaining your weight, not overeating, uh, and of course, not smoking. There are many factors that we have control over that impinge directly on the forces that drive the development of cancer that can significantly reduce our de development of cancer. And so this, I think, there is a tremendous amount that we can do as a population to reduce the incidence even though we're aging. And in particular, as one gets older, what, do, what does an individual or their now adult children need to look for in, let's say, their aging parent, or if you're an aging individual, that you really need to understand about your risk factors and how you should be trying to maintain your health. You've already mentioned some of these areas of prevention. I would say, first and foremost, if you have a family history for the development of cancer, you should undergo surveillance uh, regularly, and there are now uh, certain genes that we can look at to 
to assess whether or not you're at significant risk for the development of certain cancers. And there are more and more such uh, genes that are coming out that will provide us with increased visibility on assessing risk, the level of risk for any given individual. But it is also important to appreciate that as you age, there is an extraordinarily high probability that you will get cancer in your lifetime. And the most important thing that you can do is to screen. There are many diseases that if they're caught early, the mortality statistics drops precipitously. Colonoscopy, very important. Mammography, very important. Uh, getting regular skin exams if you are you know, high, highly exposed to uh, sun as a child. Those are all things that lead to a very significant impact on the reduction of mortality due to cancer. Do the numbers uh, one and two, one and three, men and women being diagnosed, do those numbers change as one ages? Yeah, essentially after the age of 60, the risk for you doubles almost every, every five years so that you end up with those one and two or one and three lifetime risk. There was a time where it was believed that older people couldn't tolerate treatment, aggressive treatment, chemotherapies. We, we've come a long way since then. The older patient population does get treated and can tolerate more aggressive treatment than we used to think. Could you comment a bit on that, please? Well, there are many advances on many fronts, and it's a lot of uh, some major advances and, and some things that are relatively small. Uh, for example, uh, surgical techniques and relatively um, you know, laparoscopic surgery, things of that nature, really diminish the impact of surgical intervention for many patients. And the, and the speed with which we can execute those operations is also markedly improved. Tremendous advances in radiotherapy, we can really pinpoint through computer technology uh, and proton beam therapy, for example, which can dramatically spare normal surrounding tissues and target very precisely the tumor burden. Uh, better uh, knowledge as to how to dose patients, the increased experience that we have, and scheduling. Also support uh, advances, for example, stem cell transplants, uh, the ability to um, have improved antibiotics, and so on and so forth, allow us to enable a patient to undergo very significant interventions and still weather the storm of the acute period during which we're, we're really trying to treat very aggressively these cancers. And I imagine with the baby boomer population, as large as, as it is, this is the group that's really going to be now impacted heavily as we see this incidence of individuals as they age getting cancer. Yes, I mean, it's, a, it's really a very important issue for people to recognize that the incidence is going to go up very dramatically overall in this country, that we do have the ability to bend that curve through things that we can do and we have control over, eating right, exercising, not smoking, not drinking to excess. Also, seeing your doctor on a regular basis and getting screening is very, very important. And quite uh, exciting advances in the area of therapy so that if you do get cancer, the chances for survival each and every year increases dramatically. And even in the face of rising incidence, we have successive declines in mortality each year. But I believe the advances that are before us today are going to lead to rather dramatic decreases in mortality in this coming decade. Thank you, Dr. Ronald. DePino from uh, UTMD Anderson Cancer Center. You are the president of a very exciting, state-of-the-art, famous place. Thank you very much. Thank you for making time to talk to us about aging and cancer. You're welcome.